Hello everyone and how are you doing? I'm Anna and I'm joining you today from Oxford University Press and I'm in Oxfordshire right now. Where are you joining us from today? Let me know in the comments below, type which country you're watching the live stream from. We've got a worldwide community of teachers and we love it. So just post a comment right now and let us know whereabouts in the world you are. To let you know a little bit more about me, I'm Anna and I work in the ELT marketing team, working on marketing campaigns and product launches. And I'm very excited today because I'm joined by, by Zarina Shuban and Patrick Jackson. Um, and we're going to have an exciting session today on how to teach eco in the ELT classroom. Zarina is an experienced teacher and teacher trainer and has taught and delivered teacher training at all levels in both private and government institutions in over 15 different countries. Since 2000, she's been involved in content and language integrated learning, CLIL, material writing, training trainers and teachers in facilitating techniques and teaching methodology. So welcome, Zarina. Thanks, Anna. Patrick has been an OUP author for our ELT primary courses for over 20 years, including Everybody Up and Shine On. Patrick believes that real world experiences and community action are the best way for teachers to engage, inspire and give meaning to classroom learning. A passionate beachcomber and litter picker, Patrick is currently working on a global project, Picker Pals, that helps children discover their role as environmental stewards and equips them with the tools to do so. So welcome to Zarina and to Patrick. How are you both doing today? Good, thank you. That's thank great. you, Anna. And where are you calling in from? I'm in Costa Rica, Anna, so it's morning time for me. How about you, Patrick? Wonderful. I wish I was in Costa Rica. I'm in Dublin, where it's the middle of the afternoon and uh, windy out there today. Mm. So we're yeah. calling in from all different places. So where is everybody on the Facebook Live joining us from? You can just write it in the chat and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And we want to know where you're calling in from calling in from and what you're up to. Um, we're really glad to have you here to talk to us about eco in the LT classroom, Serena and Patrick. So over to you. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Anna. How I'm wonderful just... to see all these people from all over the world. Isn't that Isn't extraordinary? It? It's great. I'm seeing people yeah. from Uganda, Vietnam, Argentina, Philippines. Korea, India. Isn't it's that fantastic? Very exciting. Welcome. Palestine. Yeah. Eritrea, wow, this is Brilliant. really, and Mongolia and Colombia. Yeah, and you know what, Patrick? I, yeah. Some people actually put in some uh, questions beforehand. Uh, yeah. The very keen, eager beavers yeah. um, sent in a question, and one person, there was a really interesting question uh, about poems, asked, are there mm -hmm. any poems to teach or discuss environmental issues? And that made me dig up a poem that I've used with elementary learners. Now, it's not exactly about environmental issues, but I thought it was quite flexible and it goes like this. A book opens our eyes, our hands open a book, but they must be clean and dry. The teacher must take a look. Turn the pages carefully, then they will not tear. These books can last for years and years. They're for all our friends to share. Now, you may be wondering what's that got to do with the environment, but I thought it keeps books lasting a long time. And it means that we use things again and again, reutilizing things um, and keep them forever if possible. Uh, and that just kind of brings in those things. What do you think, Patrick? Zarina, you've just inspired me to show people my the book that got me inspired to be in. Uh, a, an environmentalist and I've oh, had this book all my life. It's called The Young Explorer's Book of Nature. And uh, this was a book I had as a kid, which is full of the most fantastic um, images of, uh, of all sorts of natural things. So yes, for me, it was a book that um, uh -huh. got me going at the very beginning and I have kept it. So do I get a brownie point? Yeah, are you gonna tell us how old that book is? That book is was printed in the 1950s. 1950s. Uh, in the 1950s. And actually, I have two copies because I loved it so much. I went on eBay and I bought a second copy just in case <laughs> something happened to my first there copy. There you go. There you go. Well, I was, I was thinking because there was another question about uh, what does it mean to teach eco? 
And that poem to me kind of illustrates that it doesn't actually have to be branded as eco or about the environment. Um, it can just be a really nice thing to do with young children that you can pull things out of. Um, so it doesn't have to be about something scientific or something that you don't know about, but it could be about, um, I suppose, instilling um, a respect for our environment or nature, something as simple as that. Yeah, making a connection. I mean, I think if we can, if we can make a connection um, or help our children make a connection by mm -hmm possibly by showing our own connection um, with nature and uh, awakening that, then I think right. that's an important part of what we should do. I wonder what people people out there um, <laughs> um, think about that. Do you think that it is our role um, as, as language teachers to include some environmental thinking? Um, is this part of our job? Is it what we should be doing? Mm, Zarina, what do you think? Yeah, I like to think of myself as an educator, not just an English language teacher, though I've, that's what I've been doing for 30 years now. I've been in ELT. Um, so, yes, my speciality is language and linguistics, but, hey, why not use topics, different topics at hand to be able to do that? Yes, it's, I see Paulus is saying that it's possible. I'd love to hear what um, some other people people think. I mean, I think what you've just said there um, is is very much it, that we aren't really just English teachers, are we? You no. know, we are people and we do have our own lives and our own views and our own uh, experiences mm -hmm. uh, to share. Uh, yes. I, I, yeah. I, I drew a picture one time of a, of a potato dancing. And it mm -hmm. said, you are not just an English teacher. Now, this was before I, uh, this was before I became in, very involved in environmental sort of teaching. And, and I, you know, the way it kind of it resonates with me now that I think that it's something that's fun to add to your repertoire of, of, of teaching. But so how, how do, do you do teach? How do we do that? Um, well, I'm, I'm, you're the day-to-day -day teacher in the classroom, Zarina. So you're teaching teenagers, aren't you? I, I teach um, all levels, actually. I have taught right from, from complete uh, young learners right through to, to adults. Um, in fact, there are some resources that I've produced recently for AUP um, called Eco in the Classroom that are for all levels. Um, and that's for the topic of energy, environment and responsibility. Um, and um, I found that the simplest things that we do normally as an English language teacher in the classroom can be linked some way. So, for example, mm -hmm. teaching colours. You want young children to, to recognise colours. That's, that's a very visual thing to do with, with young learners. Um, and you could get them to say, well, find something blue whether you're doing remote teaching online or you're actually lucky enough to be in that uh, classroom with them physically, you could say, yes, yeah, find something blue. Um, does everyone have something blue out there? What's the first thing that you can find that is blue? Type in the comments box what you can, what, what you find that's blue. Sorry. Patrick, you've got so many blue things. <laughs> That's my favorite thing. color, actually. Look, look what I've got that's blue. I, I was looking yes, through I'm learning are Spanish. You, are you learning Spanish? Nice. I was I was looking through some of the um I, I imagine that most of the people in um on on this uh using a textbook of some sort or using some sort of course book. And I was looking through some course book curriculums and I was thinking it was quite a fun activity. What could I add to this lesson or what is the connection that I could take from this topic? Now, um, for example, I was looking at a lesson and it was, it was thing, you know, things in my bedroom. And I was thinking, well, that could be a connection. You could make a connection to um, reuse, you know, okay. reusing instead of just buying new things. Um, you could, uh, you could look at ways in which things are being reused in creative ways as, uh, to make an environmental connection. And I'm sure 
um, that, you know, as you go through your syllabus, it doesn't have to be, uh, I don't think you want to be, um, you know, sort of aggressively pushing it on people all the time, but you can always just drop it into the conversation, um, whatever topic you are teaching, whether it's, you know, you might be teaching vehicles, there's a bus, you know, oh, did you hear about they have, uh, you know, buses that run on coffee beans, uh, you know, that you can just drop these things in. Uh, so I think, yes, and I, I see a comment there coming in, we are, you know, we are cultural ambassadors, and I think that we are ambassadors for, we, we are ambassadors for the environment, and we have this privilege mm -hmm. of being teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Completely agree with you. And I was just thinking of the things that you could do it would be, what are things made of? So if you ask the question, you know, what did you find that was blue? Then you could say, what is it made of? And then yeah. you get into materials. So if it's elementary, basic, uh, young learner level, it could just be simple things like plastic, metal, glass, paper, and mm. classifying things. So you're learning other skills as well. It's English, but it's English for classification. Um, I was teenagers. trying to count. I was trying to count these. I found this earlier just outside my house. Nice. Uh, the beautiful big pine cone. Um, and I was trying to count the, how many of them are, uh, these little seeds are on this pine cone. And I just kept going round and round in circles. <laughs> um, but I got a lot of counting done. Uh -huh. And I think, um, I don't know, do you see a role for realia and that sort of thing in, in, in the classroom as a way of spicing things up a bit? Absolutely, yeah. You know, we had one question that was, um, do you think students are receptive to environmental topics and learning? Could it be a bit boring? Um, sometimes students don't seem very interested. But, you know, if you do that, like you, you just said with the pine cone, perhaps you get the students to bring something in of their choice, mm -hmm. whatever, wherever, or something that you found outside in the park yeah. or in your garden or on the pavement um, that's obviously clean enough. Um, you know, what is it? Could, where's, what's, is there a story behind it? And if it's personal and they have some connection to it, I think it brings things and topics to life. So it's not necessarily that maybe environmental topics are boring. It's perhaps what we do with them that mm. might be a bit boring, yeah. So perhaps handing over agency to our students and letting them be in the driver's seat, as it were, mm -hmm. to actually be able to, to talk about what part of their environment they wish to talk about. Maybe that's well, the I mean, way show and, tell, show and tell is, is such a great activity. I mean, it's yeah. definitely my favorite activity uh, is, is because, you know, one, one object takes on so much uh, life in the classroom. Can I show you something? You're going to show and tell, what, what is it? I am going to show and tell, Zarina. Shall I do it? Okay. Do okay, you are you, I, I, you're probably, I, I want to show people my cloak. Ah, oh, I've heard so much about Patrick's cloak. Wait till you well, see this, guys. I'm a show off, you see, so I'm, show and tell is just perfect for me. Um, so I'd like to show people my cloak and I'm just gonna turn my computer oh. screen around a bit. That's your cloak? Um, so this is my cloak. And it's my, more like a blanket. Well, it was a curtain once in its early life. Um, it was a curtain and then it turned into a cloak. But this cloak is covered in all the bits and pieces that I find um, on the beach. So you can probably see, maybe the people in the chat can call out something that they can see. Can you identify? Can you identify? Can you identify anything? The objects on Patrick's cloak. That is quite some cloak, isn't it? It is a crazy cloak. I, um, I think I can see, um, I was going to say a pumpkin, but I'm not sure. Yes, there is. There's a pumpkin over here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, a cassette, yeah. Romina a cassette. Says. Well done, Romina, yes. Really? One of those, what, reel-to-reel -reel cassettes? There's an old cassette here, yeah, there's Look an old cassette. That. And when yeah. did you find that, Patrick? Well, this is the product of uh, five years of 
beach cleaning around my area and um, I collect mainly rubbish but I occasionally when I find something interesting I stitch it onto my cloak and then I bring it into the classroom and and so I can tell you for sure that these objects they transform you know when when you bring some stuff like this in they, the kids go nuts you know they really do they want to touch this stuff they want to see what it is they want their uh -huh. curiosity is inspired there uh, you know they they really are in you know they, they get well into it yeah uh -huh. do you and i bet that cassette is older than some of the children right well much much older i'm sure i mean i find all sorts of very old um old things i found a i found some tickets uh, in a bottle in a plastic bottle and they had come all the way from Greenland uh, and they'd gone on this 18 year journey in a bottle. So this is the kind of, sorry, I, I can talk forever about my, <laughs> my beach finds, but that's the excitement that I, I, you know, for you, it might be something different. For every teacher, it's something else. But uh, I, I think that's kind of fun to be able to, you know, be enthusiastic about something. Absolutely. Angie carpier Reyes describes it as a trinket cloak. I like that, Angie. Can I use that, Angie? Nice. So I what like. do you what do you do in the classroom with your cloak then? Well, we've done storytelling, we've done drawing, we've done, you know, sort of spot the, you know, as you say, materials. And with little children, it's quite um it's quite interesting. You can show them, you know, you can show them something that's a bone and you can ask them is this man-made or is this um is this man-made or is this a natural thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um i mean there is an awful lot you can do with with real right. objects and that's um, great for english language because then you can talk about biodegradable non-biodegradable right absolutely yeah yeah well, it brings out all, all language comes from these things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah because we often talk about recycling but you know i wonder do do children even understand what the point is of recycling because we don't often enough i think talk about the reasons behind it that things are not biodegradable and that they're going to be around for hundreds of years if if we can't break it down um, yeah. so the I, I think uh -huh. if you make that connection with if you make the connection with what why are we doing any of this stuff because we yeah. love we, you know, because we love nature, because we love mm -hmm. animals. Yeah. Especially, you know, kids love, we love animals, we love the natural world, and uh, we, we don't want to harm it. Right. So do uh, you think it's possible, Patrick, to teach, because there was a question about this, uh, to teach something like this and other important subjects without doom and gloom, because some younger students might get a bit anxious? Not about. doom and gloom, no. <laughs> Do we have to be talking about doom and gloom, do you think? Or can it be fun? No, we, we, we don't want doom and gloom, um, especially for, for, yeah. I mean, we want young children, we want to, be, we want to show them that they're powerful. Mm -hmm. We want yes. to empower them and, and show them that they can do think, positive things. Yes, yes. And you know what? what's important for me is that young children if they have a, an emotional connection with their environment and with nature, they're more likely to keep it in mind and think about these things rather than maybe our and older generations that it was just a resource and we never really thought about our surroundings much. Um, and something like the pandemic where people have been prevented from going outdoors, I think has actually been helpful in that sense. Um, if I can actually say that, that, that people mm. have become more appreciative of nature and their surroundings. Well, it's certainly shown us that we can tackle global, um, or at least we can do our best to tackle and we have to tackle global issues uh, together. Yeah. For sure. Brought yeah. Fam, Fam Lok Mai An says, um, teaching eco doesn't mean that to teach them about eco, it comes from the inside and the mm -hmm. love of nature. I yeah, really like absolutely. that. I think yeah. that's that's a really important point. Yeah, and, um, and we need to manifest that. I think we need to show our students that we love nature in the same way as we need to show our students that we love English and that we love using English and that uh -huh. you know we love 
you know, good values or we love fairness or we love kindness. Mm -hmm. um, that it's all part of, of, our, uh, of our teaching. Yeah. And it's not just about language or the environment. I think there's so much more that comes out of teaching eco in the classroom um, because the students are getting to communicate, mm -hmm. uh, collaborate. They've got the hands on realia if they're yeah. real objects. Um, there's discussing and, and respecting each other's views and clarifying, tolerating, persuading each other. All yeah. these skills start coming out. So it's it, to me, the English classroom stops being just about reading, writing, listening, mm -hmm. and speaking. It, it and grows. Well, if you, if you, you know, for an awful lot of our students, they spend an awful lot of time indoors in classrooms. And one thing about teaching environmental uh, topics is that you're breaking down the walls of the classroom, not literally, uh, but <laughs> you're you're allowing uh, opening windows to the world and and mm -hmm. having wonderful um, things coming into the classroom. So you really are providing them with with a release from what can be a very long day inside. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how about, Zarina, what, I, I know we might, uh, I'm not sure if we don't differ on this. Do you think this is possible for, um, you know, how much do you think teachers should be encouraged to really get out there and be kind of activists or? Hmm. I'm, I'm a bit hesitant about talking about activists actually. I, I don't think as a teacher it's my role to to try and make anyone an activist. I think it's my role to get get my students thinking about things mm -hmm. um, and looking at different perspectives and analysing and being more critical and being aware of what's going on, whether they decide to to be some form of activist or not or. Um, and activist as well, I think, can be used in a bit of a political way, which I, I, I guess not many teachers are comfortable with because we're not we're not politicians, right? Um, so it's it's up to our students what they do and what they don't do. Um, but if it means somebody goes away and uh, and thinks twice about you know uh, 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 buying something they don't really need. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're not producing yet one more thing in the world that, that uh, is just going to be thrown away or end up in a landfill, then that's a good thing. Um, what I would say is uh, the environment and, and eco in the classroom is a tool to, to get students using English uh, mm -hmm. and to be thinking in English, maybe researching in English, um, to be reporting back, you know, you could do you could do um, a graph, for example, a simple graph on how many times do you flush the toilet in your home, mm -hmm. uh, how much water therefore gets you know, mm -hmm. pushed down the drain. Um, just simple things like that could become how to show data and present mm -hmm. information on a graph. Uh, what do you put on the y-axis and on, on the x-axis? And what do you need to put in the key in the legend for a graph? Those are all skills of English um, that come out through uh, data representation, but it just happens to be about something linked to the environment. Mm -hmm. So you're covering all grounds as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, it, it really, when you start making those connections, I think that's really the... Um, the thing is, I suppose, we're all on a different stage of our journey in this respect. And some people are, you know, very, very much at the beginning of a journey in environmental awareness. And some people are much more further on. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how did you find, I mean, you know, how did you become, you know, why are you, you know, here in the Oxford University Press as an expert on environmental you know, eco teaching. Oh, I wouldn't call myself an expert in environmental <laughs> like eco teaching. Um, but I actually started life as a scientist, believe it or not. Um, I qualified as a pharmacology chemist. Um, and I somehow found myself moving into 
English language teaching for scientists and engineers. Um, there was a, a role for it. Uh, I requalified and um, I found in EAP, English for Academic Purposes Teaching, and ESP, English for Specific Purposes Teaching, um, nobody wanted to teach the scientists and engineers. So it was like, Serena, would you mind having this group? Yeah. And I loved that because that was like my, my world beforehand. Um, so I fell quite naturally into the sort of sciencey mm -hmm. area of okay. English language teaching. And environmental issues um, just sort of uh, came quite naturally. And um, my background is my grandparents and parents are from India. I was brought up in the UK. So I would make regular visits to India as a child. And I saw these two very distinct worlds where in one world, you know, you bought things in plastic packaging and tin cans and you threw them away. And in another world, my grandmother was buying fresh from the market. And if something did come in a container, she would think, oh, that'll be good for storing X, Y, or Z, and she would reuse it. And so I was seeing this, this very different way in which we actually um, regarded packaging and objects. Um, uh, and so I guess that was always there in the background. Yeah. And you know, we've got people from all over the world joining us today. And I think eco, means very different things to different people in different um, mm -hmm. circumstances uh, so yeah, yeah we've got but yes i do think it's a, I, I i think it is a journey and we are you know we, we can take our students with us um to an extent and actually in many cases nowadays especially with the you know the really young kids they're really you know they're they're way ahead of they're certainly way ahead of I ever was at anywhere near that age. I mean, their awareness is is off the charts and their action and activism. I mean, to think that the environmental movement worldwide is really being led by by a child. Yes. Um, Greta Thunberg yeah. is who you're referring to, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's incredibly exciting. I mean, in Ireland, we have loads of kids, uh, you know, primary school children and young uh, teenagers who are leading the movement uh, to to take back the the environment and it's really really exciting really yes exciting. I, I came across a, a nice statistic actually mm. patrick um recently um ofcom um who are the uk media regulator uh, they've interviewed three and a half thousand british children um in 2018 and 2019 and um they were between the ages of 12 and 15, and 10% uh, more of these uh, teenagers had signed some sort of social media petition or taken mm -hmm. some kind of action um, in terms of the environment. And they're calling it the Greta Thunberg effect. Of but course. I'm really keen to know from our teachers and educators who've joined us, how much are there um students mm -hmm. into eco topics are they interested do you find them wanting to do things what are your feelings out there let us know um, mm -hmm. we've got william alfredo from peru hello i've worked in peru for a while so and yolanta said um being environmentally aware starts at home with the way you've been brought up and that's certainly my mother has been out litter picking around this neighborhood for decades before oh, i started there you go that's where you get it from i think absolutely yeah she was uh, putting signs up um i'm a great man for making signs yeah here we go litter, litter kills <laughs> you see that's that's an english language activity right there creating posters <laughs> about a topic yeah how would you how would you raise awareness in your community and put students into groups and they make a nice big poster yeah it's a great activity isn't yeah. it yeah 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 and i think it, it is a nice comment there from yolanta about um 
it starts at home, which is why we could do so much with young learners, I think, because they become the ambassadors, don't they? And they go home and tell their parents and family mm -hmm. what, what to do and what not to do and how to do it. And uh, they can change behavior. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'd love to mention the program I've been working on, Zarina. Do you think that would be OK, the pick up? Go on, tell us about I mean, it, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it is, it's about, it's exactly what you're talking about. So we equip um, kids with, we, we send them a pack to their classroom and the pack contains the litter pickers and they go and they take those home, they take it in turns and they each go home um, uh, with the litter picker and then they do the activity, litter picking in the uh, you know the area and then they come back and they have a report they fill in a report and they get storybooks and and uh, they motivate each other and so this what, kind what of do they you know, fill in, in their report Patrick they draw a picture this is kind of for primary so they draw a little picture and it's and then they answer three questions it's like where did you go who did you go with and what did you pick up mm -hmm. and so you know they they usually you know went with a parent usually uh, and yeah, went to the park, went to the beach, went to the woods, and then they picked up cans and bottles and all the stuff that that, uh, that they do. But that, then they get a, a membership card. And so we're trying to create a community and, and a sense of um, a, a sense of accomplishment. We celebrate their action, uh, and then we celebrate that together. So that gives them the positive feedback. So I think you know, for small, yeah, I mean, everybody likes a pat on the back. Yeah. Uh, so I Absolutely. Think yeah. Sort of structured, structured action um, is is kind of uh, yeah. It's working very well. We've we hit our two hundredth classroom today. Oh, so, congratulations! Very, very pleased. Yay! Hey, <laughs> nice number to reach. Hey, so I was just thinking you could do a, a nice activity with teenagers on a similar ground, but because teenagers are into their gadgets and things you could get them to pick up the trash and then photograph it yeah what they've picked up um or photograph different items of, of trash objects that they've found in outdoors mm -hmm. um, and make up a little story there around are, those um, there are a lot of excellent uh, movements on social media around this there's there's one called two minute beach clean uh, mm -hmm. two minute beach clean which is take you know do exactly that do two minutes just two minutes and then take a photo and, and post it um, and there was a very good one which was taking a picture before and after so this was before we did a clean this is after and then put those two pictures together and nice. that kind of um celebrating positive action mm -hmm. I, I think is really really uh, it, it's important for us to do because that's them telling their story Mm -hmm. um, and then everyone seeing that actually doing this kind of activity is not strange or it doesn't mean that you're, you know, unusual in any way, that you're just, you know, and it's fun. Yes. So, and I think this kind of activity, you know, is great for students who maybe aren't linguistically strong or feel they're not and they think all mm -hmm. oh, languages isn't for me. But when it involves these other actions, yeah. Um, uh, their strengths come out uh, and things that you you never noticed about um, a student really comes out when they do these other types of activities. Um, I saw a nice activity described um, for drawing a picture of a beach. And you say, okay, draw a picture of a beach that you may have been to or not, or is a complete something from your imagination that doesn't have anything to do with humans on it only natural objects that you can see on the beach and then you draw a, the same beach after humans have visited it and mm. you add things to your picture uh, and then as an English language activity you can say um, before the beach mm. was and you describe how the beach was so you're using past tense uh, you're using descriptive words and then you say after the visit, 
we found this on the beach and there was this or people left their tin cans behind. And so, again, you've got use of, of past tense, but you've got comparison of before and after going on. And you've got lots of language possibilities coming out. But the student is in charge of the level of language as well and the simplicity of the language. So you're not enforcing any particular um, level of language on the learners. So you could do it at completely different levels for all right the way through from young learners to adults. Um, and it can be as com complex as you want it to be. So it's quite, it's, it's very creative, the whole it process. Is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's communicative, which is what yeah. we're striving for in the English language classroom. And it's CLIL. Absolutely, yes. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Patrick. Nice. CLIL, Content and Language Integrated Learning, if you've not heard of CLIL before. Um, because I came from a science background, I really found that there wasn't enough uh, that interested science, engineering, mathematical students because they weren't really into languages. They were into sort of their type of topics. So I started trying to produce my own materials just to... to to make up for the, the lack of what was out there. Um, that was some, you know, nearly 30 years ago. And now we have a lot more in terms of content language integrated learning going on with materials being produced. Um, and for me, if, if you can bring out um, other skills at the same time as learning about a, a topic while you're doing language as well, it becomes more engaging for the learner because we as English language teachers, we're really into grammar. We're into um, you know, sentence structure and, and we, we get a bit of a buzz out of it. But our students are like, yeah, and you know, they're, they're not interested in that. So if we can engage them with things that they want to talk about, uh, then they're learning and they can teach their peers mm. about things that they found. Well, and another thing I'd, I'd just add to that, if I may, um, is this global consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, this, this global consciousness that environmental teaching uh, brings with it. Um, so, you know, English is a global, uh, you know, obviously English is a, is a, we're teaching English because it's a globally useful thing to be able to do mm -hmm. to speak English it's, that connects people all around the world as does as do all these environmental issues and the solutions to these um, environmental issues um, so I think that is a, a valid connection to make yeah. I mean I always uh, I, I always think of St. Patrick um, for some reason uh, who um, who as you may know he picked up a shamrock and he used the shamrock to explain this difficult theological um concept um, Patrick, he, the shamrock is the four-leafed clover it's well it's about. it's a three-leafed uh it's it's not a clover and it's three-leafed but it okay. yeah it is yes it's, it's the symbol of of ireland um and saint patrick so he used this uh this leaf which he just picked up to explain something and i always think that this really is as teachers and uh, you know as, as english teachers this is really what we have to look to local stuff, things that we find locally, easily, that are all around us, um, and then use those to uh, illustrate and connect us with, with bigger, wider things, uh, bigger, yes. wider values. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting you, you mentioned that because wider values, you could talk about global issues. Um, and um, I don't know if you've seen that uh, position paper that, OUP produced some time back on global skills. Um, it's kind of similar to the 21st century skills that people were talking about, but here we are in the 21st century. And so, um, uh, and, and global skills um, is, is termed as communication and collaboration, um, intercultural competence and citizenship skills emotional self-regulation, well-being, and digital literacies. And I think the topic of the environment fits in perfectly with that mm -hmm. because you can encourage learners to go out and research, 
but be critical about what they find. You know, what was the mm -hmm. source? Where did they find it? You know, was it Donald Trump's opinion on climate change, or was it a scientist's opinion on climate change, for example? You know, um, and they also uh, regulate what they feel emotionally, their connection with with the environment, and the environment could be a local community where they live, you know, it doesn't have to be, we're not talking about forests and, and seas necessarily when we talk about environment. Um, and then the citizenship, that responsibility of, well, we ought to be keeping our beaches clean if, mm. you know, no other reason. Um, it's a good thing to have a clean environment uh, and, and, and to not and throw litter. Encouraging um, an identity in young people, of people uh, as people who who do care, mm -hmm. and because obviously, at, at you know, when you're when you're a teenager, there's obviously you know there's the kind of I don't care route you go, or there's the I care route, um, and to encourage teenagers to go down the I care route uh, is you know, and and to stand up and um, actually take on some responsibility yep. for for their neighbourhood and and for, for the wider world. Yes, is really. It, it, it saves. It'll save them a lot of trouble in the r long r run, keeping them on the I care route. Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. also spare some of the damage they might do. Yes. So David Attenborough is, is a big hero of mine. I've watched him yeah. since I was a little girl. Uh, it was his birthday on Saturday, actually. Uh, so it's quite fitting that we're talking about the environment. How old is he now? He's ninety-five. Gosh. Bless him. Right. Yes, but he said um, it. He he did this meet up with Greta Thunberg. It was lovely to watch the two of them interacting. You know, her. Uh, I think she's seventeen now, and him, uh, ninety four. He was at the time, and he said, "Self interest is for the past, mm. and common interest is for the future." And I think that's that really sums it up, and it's what what eco in the classroom can be about it doesn't have to be about anything political or, or um, taking you know, political action necessarily it's actually about thinking about uh, common interests in society um, and and locally and globally how we can affect our environment um, and I think that that's a good thing you know whether you you feel you are an environmentalist or not, if you can help students become better people um, and we can produce better societies, then surely it's a win-win, isn't it? Zarina, I don't think we can do any better than what you've just said. I, I don't think we, it, it, it's downhill from here, you know, that was, <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, <laughs> And I wonder whether we should let people get on with their lives and go out there and do these wonderful things. Well, I could sit here forever and talk about this with you, Patrick. I've really enjoyed it. Have you seen this um, cartoon that was done um, by, uh, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist, Joel Pett. Um, and he worked for, at the time for uh, USA Today the newspaper in the US. And he produced this cartoon. Um, our team have put it up for, for everyone to see. And it was, it was done just before 2009 um, Copenhagen Climate Change Conference. So you've got this speaker at the front saying all the things that you have to do. And there's this person standing up saying, but what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's what it's about, creating a better world. And mm. whether you believe in climate change or not, or whether you're an environmentalist or not, it's about creating a better world. Yeah. 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 So you carry on doing your beach combing, Patrick. I think it's fantastic. Uh, well, I can't stop. And you carry on what you're doing, because I think it's fantastic too, Zarina. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I hope everyone has enjoyed this as much as I have. Um, what do you think, Anna? 
Yeah, that was such an interesting session. Thank you so much, Zarina and Patrick. I think there's some real golden nuggets there for people to take away across all the different segments. Um, so thank you very much for your time today. And um, for everybody who's watching the Facebook Live, if you liked this live session today, make sure you like it. And if you love it, make sure you love it. <laughs> and please do share it as well. If you know a teacher that needs it in their life, then do tag them in the comments. Um, it really does help us out and make sure you're following us for future updates. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter or YouTube and we are at OUP ELT Global. We've got many more sessions like this one on the way to you very soon. In fact, we want to make these sessions all about you. So let us know in the comments what you'd like us to talk about next. And last but not least, a very big, huge thank you to Patrick and Zarina for joining us today. Thank you so much for your insight. I know that I learnt a lot. Um, if you'd like to hear more from Patrick, you can follow him on Twitter. His handle should be coming up on the screen um, below. And you can also find out more about Picker Pals on Instagram as well. And if you'd like to hear more from Zarina, you can visit the OUP ELT blog to read some of her articles and the link is in the comments as well. So thank you very much from all of us and we hope you have a good morning, afternoon, wherever you're calling in from. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone.